Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, so today is for beginners, uh, but actually, you know, if you're truly an advanced singer, uh, then this stuff is really important to you as well. So I'm always going back to the fundamentals, getting a sense of, you know, what makes it hard for people to sing in general, and that's going to help you as a beginner and as an advanced singer. Um, but this is definitely geared towards people who are just getting started and sort of why we get stuck and sort of um, some concepts that I see happen a lot with a lot of beginning students that sort of turns them off from the journey of singing. Um, a lot of times it's like people coming back and saying, you know, I stopped singing. I really like singing. <laughs> Hi, welcome. <laughs> nice, uh, nice emoji there. <laughs> um, you know, like a lot of people are like, I really like singing and it's something that I enjoy, but for some reason at a young age, um, uh, you know, or, you know, at any age, someone's, you know, sort of said something or, uh, you know, in school, there's all sorts of reasons why people uh, stopped pursuing that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can see that you're a frustrated singer. Um, yeah, yeah, no, seriously, though, uh, this is kind of like a battle that singers have all the time. And you'll find that, hi, welcome, even uh, really, really professional singers go through a lot of mental gymnastics about what it is they're doing and why and how to connect with their body. And we're going to get into that. Um, so this is really great. It's great to see so many people. Um, and I, you know, I encourage you chime in, talk about some of your frustrations as well, and I'll try to address them as we go. And they'll probably fit into some of the things that I mentioned. Um, the first thing, sort of the first concept, and we'll just kind of dive right in, is I get a lot of people, even on this as well, you know, on the live streams, talking about how they really don't like the sound of their voice. Um, this can be your speaking voice, and certainly when you start singing. Uh, and then also kind of the other, the flip side of this, I don't like the, the way that my voice feels when I start trying to sing. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. It's kind of a plug for the practice in general. One of the things I talk about is learning to sing uh, is something that you can, or singing is something that you can learn. It's um, certainly a learned skill. And, uh, you know, some people might have a natural predisposition towards it. We'll talk about sort of why some people get uh, into it faster than others or, you know, or get, get a lot of positive reinforcement as well. Uh, but ultimately, it's something that you uh, can get better at and you can change the tone of your voice. Um, you can make it more efficient, uh, conditioning and stretching the voice. So think of it like being an athlete. Um, this is like a sport in a lot of ways, and it's a subtle sport, you know, athlete of small muscles is what I always talk about. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to do yoga because I'm not flexible, um, or I don't like the way that my body looks. This is a great analogy. Um, doing this kind of work actually helps you improve that stuff. So, of course, you know, almost every beginner is going to start with that feeling. And so one of them is patience, getting into a routine and having a practice that you actually follow is going to be really, really helpful. Um, so enjoying the process, you know, sometimes we focus so much on like, well, you know, if I don't have a beautiful voice or sort of an inkling towards that potential, then I might as well not do it. Um, this is something that, you know, perhaps is a cultural phenomenon as well. Um, it's fine to do things even if you're not excelling at them, especially if you enjoy them. And singing is a really good example of that. And it's something that you, through the process of enjoying and sort of exploring your voice, it actually gets more beautiful and more, um, you get more in control of it. You start to understand it more. Uh, and so we'll talk about too, like um, a lot of the times, ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. We'll talk about this, you know, the, the sore throat experience as well. You know, that's part of this is like the feeling of singing can sometimes be really frustrating. In fact, this leads me to this point. Sometimes, you know, when we don't like the sound of our voice or the way that it feels, it's usually uh, an indication of an imbalance somewhere. We're doing something too much or too little with our voice. And so it's actually, um, it's sort of the um, step forward, you know, at the concert or, or afterwards. Some people also feel it a little bit afterwards, and that's usually a, not a good sign. Um, but, you know, just like being an athlete, we get a little sore as we do this. We just need to monitor it, like, when we're going too far. Um, but yeah, again, a lot of these things where we like feel uncomfortable with a sound or a sensation, it's usually because there's an imbalance and we're not in control. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, and actually, here's kind of the point. Um, 
like our body changes a lot, you know, and from day to day, we need to check in. Yeah, that'll happen. I <laughs> totally you have to be careful at concerts sometimes, you know, getting those um, decibel reducing earplugs so you don't damage your ears, um, you know, when we're talking a lot and uh, or, you know, screaming and stuff like that, along with things we can really um, fatigue ourselves, especially late at night, you know, where a lot of these a lot of these performance concerts are, are happening. Um, but again, I, you know, I want to talk about that this is the practice. So when you start to notice things that are uncomfortable, that's kind of your first step of awareness to start working towards something. And then it takes some time. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I also Ed Sheeran, great singer as well. Um, highly recommend. Um, yeah, yeah. And we'll talk about these, the fry screaming, all these cool things, you know, again, kind of the point is when you're a beginner, you want to start with the mentality of exploration, a growth mentality. It's not an evaluation of your voice. It's actually more about the potential where you can go with it. And so if you're feeling discomfort, that's actually, um, that's where we start kind of working as, as voice teachers as well. Um, so this is kind of my, my first plug, which is a lot of people don't even start, right? Because they don't like the sound or the feeling and they think it's hopeless. But uh, I highly, I highly recommend that if you stick with it and you develop a practice, just like going to the gym or doing a sport, you're going to feel it's going to get easier and more efficient. Um, that's the whole point of this. And you definitely can learn it. Uh, in fact, that's kind of the secret about all of it is the art form is to make it look effortless. It's really, you know, if I'm going to talk about what singing is, it's um, a coordination game and it's about balance a lot of the time, finding balance states in our body. Uh, and when we don't have that balance, we start to get tensions, we get uh, out of control with the kind of tone or the quality of our voice. And so it sometimes doesn't match. And here's my other point. This is what's so frustrating about singing is things that people tell you in voice class that, oh, avoid this, avoid this, especially if you're like going on the classical track. Um, those things, you know, like nasality, um, breathiness, um, you know, all, there's, you know, too bright, too dark, et cetera, et cetera. They're all um, specific maybe to what a, a singing teacher is hearing and they're trying to sort of sculpt it. But, uh, you know, ultimately all of these kinds of sounds that we create can be really, really beautiful if they're put in the right context. So sometimes it's a mismatch with what you're trying to accomplish and the kind of art or the kind of music that you're trying to sing and make. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what I'd recommend. You know, you'll find that when you, really pair your voice appropriately and you find that and that's a journey finding the right kind of music creating the right music that fits your voice finding artists um, and then subtly slowly shifting um, stretching and conditioning the voice you can start to get to um, things that actually fit with what you're you're going for with your goals but it takes some time to kind of evaluate you know so again sometimes people find that certain qualities of their voice are like bad or something that they want to avoid. And it's actually, I'm like, go towards that, understand it, get in control of it uh, and figure out how it applies and matches with the music that you're making. So a lot of times what some, something doesn't sound right to us, it's usually a mismatch with the other sounds that are happening around it. So we learn to be in control of our body and singing is all about the mind body connection. So uh, it takes time to train your muscle memory to understand all the different components. Um, that's why I, you know, I plug for having a teacher that can kind of speed up this process and help you figure out what you need to focus on so you can get the best results. Cause we can get stuck in a lot of infinite loops, you know, vicious cycles, as I talk about infinite vicious cycles. And this is where uh, you're aspiring towards a certain quality in the voice because someone tells you that that's actually the best way that you should sound. And I'll tell you that it's not quite about that. I think a free voice is a beautiful voice and a voice where you can make choices and you can be expressive is, um, is a profound experience. And I think a lot of times that's what we're going for. So what's so frustrating is you might hear someone who's, they're using nasality, they're doing all these things, we're breaking all the rules, but it sounds good because um, they're in control of it. They're figuring out how to match it with the music that they're making and they're creating something beautiful. So. That's my first sort of plug, which is for the practice, which is try this stuff out and you'll start to understand why we do a lot of the things that we do. This leads me to the next sort of frustration, which is what are singing teachers doing? You know, you look online, there's a lot of information out there, right? There's a lot of different strategies. Um, a lot of people telling you, 
definitely avoid this and definitely do this, et cetera, et cetera. Or this is the way that, you know, this is what made me really famous and popular, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can get really confusing to know what to do. Uh, the voice is about balance and people can have imbalances in different places. And so one sort of solution for one singer might be the exact opposite sort of thing for another singer. So uh, it can be really, really complicated. The other thing is um, the practice, at least for what I, you know, the way I think about it, it's about the mind body connection. So this gets complicated, right? We have to deal with our perception and we also have to deal with mechanics and voice science. And I find a lot online, uh, people kind of do this either or kind of a thing where they're like, um, you know, you need to, you know, we now know the voice science and there are four distinct shapes and modes of the voice. And so if you just do that and you don't think about any of the sensations, then you're going to be okay. There's some issues with that because you're avoiding uh, your sort of neurological response, your perception and the feeling of your voice is really important. Um, but I also get on the other side that, you know, a lot of voice teachers before we had better understanding of the mechanism, were just teaching from their sensation and perception, thus chest voice and head voice. You know, these two concepts are about the sensation of singing, but it's actually all resonating here and it's creating vibration that's sympathetically vibrating to our rib cage. And sympathetically, we might feel a little bit in our head or the, just the perception of the sound being up higher above our head. It's actually kind of like a big C shape. It's sort of a way that a lot of people um, feel that sensation. So some, you know, there's this classic side of like, imagine you are a balloon expanding, you know, your head is floating above the clouds. And for some people that doesn't work very well. They're like, I need to know what I'm specifically doing. Um, but the other side is also kind of problematic. You can explain how the voice works until you're blue in the face, but if you're not tracking with what it feels like in your body and you're trying to kind of merge the two together and find balance and an interplay, then you might also be off because you're not checking in with your body. So um, perception is important, but perception can be misleading. Um, you know, science asks very specific questions and we can use that to sort of ground ourselves. You know, when we're dealing with our sensation, we can get really lost and we can um, really, really ground ourselves with understanding some of the basic things about the mechanism and what's going on. However, if you focus on that, you might be oversimplifying or over reducing a complex process. And so thus you can see this is actually kind of tricky. And so people can get very, very frustrated seeing stuff out there, you know, don't do this, do this. Trust voice science, trust the feeling and the perception and, uh, you know, imagery and all of these kinds of things. To me, it's both things that they're not mutually exclusive. We can work with our perception of our voice and the sensations, and we can use the voice science to guide that and make sure that we're doing things in a healthy way um, and understand sort of how a lot of people do things. It's also important to note, you know, a lot of voice science where kind of in the beginning of this phase uh, of understanding the voice and there's more work to be done. And with any science, you always have to go look at the studies and see what's really going on. Cause again, a lot of people can use the guise of science to oversimplify things or um, they fixate on a certain thing based on a study, but the sample size was really small or it was only uh, men or it was only a, you know, a particular, uh, demographic that, that was focused on. And so, you know, ultimately I've, I've found, and this is true for a lot of, um, singing teachers who kind of go into depth with this, that there's more work to be done. There are more studies to be made and, uh, more that we can learn from that. So I leave this open, you know, we, for thousands of years, singing teachers have been guiding with sensation and, uh, and finding what a free voice is like, and then explaining that to people. And that's also really, really valid. So, you know, you can talk about the, the technical names and rename everything and the modes of the voice, but, you know, we have to label it somehow. And so it's just a note that when we're, when people are labeling things with the voice, they're actually uh, a lot of times like chest voice and head voice, it's referring to the sensation. And so thus people start coming into the voice practice and they're asking like, uh, what are you doing? Why, why are we doing these exercises? And this is why I do a lot of explanation. Um, we are trying to guide people towards a certain sensation using both voice science and perception. So I always ask people like, what is that feeling like? I can kind of hear things based on uh, certain sounds that are coming out. Uh, and then we, we learn to kind of 
find more balance and sort of work with that, right? That sensation uh, is telling me this with my body over time. So a lot of the practices are about helping us find those sensations in our body. Um, that can be tricky, right? So it's always going to feel a little different. Our body constantly is changing and thus it has to be a practice and kind of a lifestyle in some ways. So if you're new to all of this, I always just tell people stick with it, keep trying to feel it. And then some of the answers are going to become more clear as you keep doing the practice. Um, very similar to a yoga. You might think you're doing the same, the right posture. Uh, and then over time you realize that you can get deeper into that sort of experience, right? There's this classic idea of the posture asks a question and how you feel is the answer. So with our practice, it's the same thing. We do exercises to kind of parcel out or sort of separate out different parts of our voice to kind of see, oh, this isn't really activating or I'm building up tension in this particular part of my body. So thus mind body connection. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, so there's some things about, yeah, um, foods and stuff like that as well. I can see that there's some questions with that. Um, generally, like it's also this actually this kind of this this follows suit with what I was talking about. Um, everybody's body is a little different. So there are certain things that sometimes people's bodies react to that can be have a negative impact on the voice. But people can also get very superstitious about this. Pay attention to what your body does. Don't try to do any sort of drastic changes. So uh, an energy drink that someone, someone mentioned, sometimes sugar can cause, um, a lot of like phlegm buildup for some people. Uh, and so that could be a problem. Also, if you're really, really hyped up, it might affect your nervous system in a certain way that makes you a little too agitated to really ground down into your voice. So a lot of what I do with my practice, right, is to actually first get myself into a relaxed state. This helps with the performance side of it, right? And one of the big frustrations people have is, it's scary to do stuff in front of people like this kind of stuff. Even, you know, I'm just talking into a camera, but you know, sometimes I get nerves just like anyone else. And you'll find many famous performers deal with nerves and anxiety, these kinds of things. So, you know, public speaking, right? Scary thing. Imagine singing in front of people. So a lot of people don't even want to do it right off the bat right there. Um, and so, yeah. And, you know, and, and then same thing with water, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, that's, you know, obviously hydration is very good for you, but when we just chug water right before we sing, we're often kind of stripping moisture off of our, um, you know, from our sort of pharynx in this sort of mouth area, and we can feel really, really dry. Um, ultimately, it's not going down our windpipe, right? So, you know, if that happened, we would start coughing. So water is really great. It can help us feel a little more lubricated, but sometimes if you're overdoing it, um, you can actually feel very, very dry, sort of that cotton mouth sensation. And then that can really mess with your perception of your singing. Um, so it's funny, um, the sort of the science behind it is water is not quite at our natural pH. So it'll just sort of strip more water, uh, moisture as it goes down. Uh, and then it takes some time for it to hydrate our vocal folds. So steam, a lot of people use these little nebulizer like things, um, especially if you're like someone who goes on planes a lot or in a very, very dry climate. Um, some hydration through uh, steam is actually the kind of the fastest way you can get uh, stuff into your, your vocal folds to actually help hydrate them. Uh, some, you know, there's some famous anecdotal things about like eating an apple or, you, you know, uh, uh, the pectin in the, the apple, you know, Pavarotti would do this, you know, hide apples around the little slice of apples around the stage. Um, and it's a, a way that you can get a better sort of hydrated sensation. So you can see again, our voice has a lot to do with our body and sort of um, some people are like avoid milk, you know, or spicy foods or sour foods, et cetera, et cetera. You, the, the clear answer is you need to pay attention to how things affect your body. Uh, and that's going to get you a better sense of how to kind of maintain your throat and keep things in a consistent state. Um, water is really good for the voice, but there's a timing effect. So if you're drink chugging water right before you start to sing, it's a little too late to hydrate it that way. That's what I would tell people. So you want to stay, you know, hydrated generally throughout the day. Um, it takes time to actually rehydrate your vocal folds. So if you're chugging water right in the, um, the like right before you start to sing, that could actually backfire and you could start to feel really, really dry, especially if you're uh, extra nervous. And then uh, your perception of singing might change a lot. And that might start make you, uh, it might start to make you doubt certain aspects of your muscle memory and start changing things about your voice. And then 
people get into this really vicious cycle. Uh, so again, this is why you can see these things can be complicated. The best thing you can do is pay attention to how your body responds to things. If you're feeling dry all the time, you're probably not drinking enough water in general. That's actually going to really help your voice. Um, if you feel really tight all the time, uh, you you might be out of alignment. Yes, especially alcohol. That's um, that's an obvious one as well. Um, that what happens is it brings all the capillaries to the surface a little more in your vocal folds. It's more likely to actually damage your vocal folds if you um, if you're drinking alcohol and singing, uh, and it can also sort of dry things out because of, you know the the process. So. Yes, you can see how these things can play a role. Um, acid reflux, allergies, all of these things can make it really hard to get into singing because we're dealing with inflammation and we're trying to reduce that inflammation so that we can work our voice in a way that feels healthy and comfortable. Um, so again, same thing about being an athlete, right? We want to take care of our entire body to help our voice. but The muscles are small and we can't see them, right? Here's the other frustrating thing. We can't consciously control the muscles in our larynx. Um, if we feel like we're doing something with our throat, it's the muscles around the larynx that are squeezing things and that leads to some issues. Um, so all of these things, sometimes the best thing you can do is figure out some of these things outside of your voice practice and that can help you uh, get into singing so you can have uh, more good days where it feels more comfortable. So that follows with that sort of first category of I don't like the sound or the feeling in my voice. Sometimes there's other things going on and uh, so that's why I highly recommend taking a moment to kind of think about your body, about your alignment. This is the first part of my practice is doing some stretch, stretching uh, to work with mobility in the spine, the lower back and the upper back and finding balance with this. Um, this is where posture really plays a role. If we're in a chronically bad posture, uh, think of it like our, especially up here, think of it like our instrument is right here. And so every time we go to sing, what happens for a lot of people is it kind of kinks. So you're like trying to play your saxophone and you go and it gets smaller and it sort of gets bent out of shape. So this can lead to some issues as well. So anyways, this is kind of what I wanted to talk about is the singing practice can be a little confusing. It's not just about doing endless drills and exercises. It's about paying attention to what they feel like and sort of um, asking yourself questions about where you want to sort of move your voice condition and stretch it, having a teacher can really help you navigate some of these things. Um, so that's sort of on the, the heady side of it. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so yeah, popping the neck. So again, this, these things can become a habit, right? If you're chronically popping your head and your neck and you're doing things like that, uh, it means that it's getting stuck in those positions throughout the day. And you want to kind of think more consciously about that. Um, but at the same time, you know, having a chiropractor help you with alignment can be very, very helpful. Uh, we just don't want to do this all the time because it can start to fatigue things. And um, yeah, that's sort of that sort of that game. So I'm always taking a moment while I'm singing and I'm making sure that I have flexibility up here. A lot of the times we tend to try and help our voice by squeezing things around our face. Um, and we'll talk about why that's not very helpful, actually and leads to a lot of the frustration, right? Like jaw pain, tongue tension, shoulders, squeezing the throat. These are all things that we want to avoid. Um, and this kind of gets me into what are we doing with our practice? So let's dive into some actual physical things that we can work on, right? Because again, you can explain voice theory uh, until you're blue in the face, but ultimately we need to find these sensations in our body. And that's a journey for everybody. Uh, and it takes different strategies and different tools. So you might notice that, you know, especially with the 30 day singer sub, uh, Camille and I are trying to find different tools to help different people. And so it's sort of a tool belt. We find out, um, oh, I, this, this singer might need this strategy. And if that doesn't work and you're not feeling a lot of improvement, you, you can try other strategies. They're all just different uh, techniques and tactics that people have learned over time to help them find balance in their voice. It's ultimately about finding these balanced states where it feels really effortless. And again, that's one of the things that's very frustrating. The art form uh, is to make things be effortless and in balance. And so when someone's really good at it, it just looks like they just woke up and were, you know, they were born that way. And that's why we sort of get this mentality that, oh, you know, that person just inherently is very talented, uh, but it's just not the case. That's just actually how the practice works. So 
Um, let's talk about some of these concepts and please uh, ask questions here. Um, so one of the biggest things that uh, beginning singers have a frustration with is understanding support and feeling out pitch accuracy and sort of how to even control pitch with our voice. So this is tricky. You know, a lot of the times it's actually more of a physical thing and it has to do with our inability to coordinate our vocal support appropriately. And that's where a lot of pitch uh, issues kind of originate from. It's less about like, you know, the, yeah, the numbers are really helpful to refine this process, but it's more of a technical issue a lot of the time. And this is true for most beginning singers is they just are having trouble understanding how we build up pressure with our voice and how, how we actually move up and down with the pitches. It maps backwards. And this is what's so confusing. We actually sing uh, and we control our, a lot of our pressure from our lower abdominal muscles and they're in, internal. It feels really hard to isolate those muscles without moving our upper abdominal muscles and squeezing from here. Um, I'll show this in a second in some ways that you can start to feel this out. But this is actually one of the biggest things that you can really do as a uh, beginning singer to start getting an understanding. Don't worry about getting exact perfect pitches. We're just trying to follow contour. Like I want my voice to go up. I'm going to try, and I'll show you this the process. I'm gonna try some things to see if I can get my, my pitch to rise and then get my pitch to fall. Um, so our voice is very comfortable doing things on a sliding scale. Unfortunately, a lot of music, especially in Western music is about hitting specific notes at certain times. So we tend to get very rigid around this and it makes us tend to lock our body or do something called a guarded breath as we're trying to, to sing. And that makes things too rigid. And then it's, uh, it's hard for our body to adjust from one pitch to the next. So we get kind of stuck there. Um, yeah. Oh, I see. That's, that's really awesome. No worries. You know, these things are recorded, so you can always come back and check out the rest of this. Um, but you know, a lot of this is trying to get people just in the door, getting started with your practice, understanding what we're going for. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is try and breathe from our lower belly. I call this belly breathing. Um, the fancy term is diaphragmatic breathing, but a lot of people get confused by this term because of the whole voice science. We don't have to go over that so much, but in general, the, sim the simple sort of concept and the sensation of it is that we want our belly and our back to expand and drop down as we take our breath, rather than this other way that we can breathe, clavicular breathing, where we can rise and fall. So if you're taking breaths to sing and you're going, lifting up like this, we're getting off of actually the, the, the muscles that help us control our pitch. And so you're gonna immediately feel um, an inability to control pitch very much. So the trick is first to try and get this kind of breath. And I'm gonna show this uh, by standing actually, cause I don't do this very often, but we're trying to breathe from here. Belly, a little bit here to help stabilize things. You'll feel these muscles kind of expand. That can, it, right off the bat, that can be a little hard for people to release those muscles. You know, we're usually pretty nervous about letting go of the belly muscles, uh, you know, as we normally in a lot of athletic situations suck up and in. This is this opposite sit sensation. We're trying to get our belly to drop. Now, the next confusing thing is how do we create resistance of air? And this is, um, this is how the voice kind of functions, at least from one side of it, thinking about our lower body. As we breathe low, pulls our diaphragm flat, gives us lots of space for our lungs. And then we're able to control that pressure with these lower abdominal muscles. Um, if you do a gentle cough and you go like, <coughs> you should feel these muscles <coughs> kick out a little bit. That's a way that we can kind of guide these sensations. Um, once you know that sort of sensation, then you can just control it with your mind. And so this is where it gets confusing, right? A lot of singers are doing these internal little flexes, pushing out, and that's creating pressure. And that helps us uh, sing higher. So as we sink down and we push out, our pitch rises. And as we let our breath go, the pitch falls. It's very counterintuitive, right? So that's the first thing that you wanna feel out as a singer. And it can be very, very frustrating. It takes some time actually to get that coordination. Think of it like being like a, 
a yo-yo artist or a, a surfer or something. It takes a sec to actually pop up on the board and feel these things. And this is a routine and a practice that you can do to just gain better coordination of these muscles. You can blow against your hand and go create pressure. And I'm actually focusing right here. Right? I'm trying to get these lower abdominal muscles to pop out. Um, so the point of the practice is actually just to gain connection to those muscles. That's not exactly what it feels like when we're singing, but it's a necessary and big uh, important component is our vocal support. So it has to do with our lower belly, right? And that's already confusing for a lot of people. You'd think, oh, I should be singing with things here. That's why it's frustrating, right? We can't actually consciously control these muscles very well. It's indirect. And we're actually controlling it by our lower abdominal muscles. So what you can do is some of these hissing exercises. I'm keeping my mouth barely open. I'm not pushing from here. I'm not trying to squeeze these muscles. I'm actually engaging my lower my lower abdominal muscles, flexing out, and this creates some resistance of air. So it's like, or you can even pulse it and go like, again, it looks like nothing's happening here. And I'm actually completely focused on this part. I'm like, trying to feel if I can control and flex those muscles. So that's already a big challenge. So the next uh, concept that I'll, I'll, I'll usually lead a, a beginning student through is how do I connect this to my voice? So think of like a Z or another small space. This goes with the voice science. It's these concept of SOVTs. Again, we know this, and that's kind of the job of a, a teacher. And the, you know, if understanding a little bit about voice science is going to be helpful for you to know when there are red flags, when a teacher is only teaching from perception, that can be an issue. Um, but essentially we need to feel this out and learn to control it in our body. So when I do like a Z and I start singing, zzz, zzz, I'm gonna feel a little bit of engagement in my belly. I'm putting my hand there just to feel it. Um, that can be helpful for a lot of people. Now I'm just trying to do that for a second. Zzz, zzz, and feel sensation in my body. Now I call this a gentle siren. We're trying to go up and down with our pitch the tendency for a lot of beginning singers, and this is very frustrating, is we follow the sensation. We go like zzzz. It's actually the opposite. You want to sink down and your pitch is going to rise up. And then as we relax those muscles, the pitch is going to fall. So it goes like this. Zzzz. And again, I'll stand just to show this because I think it's you know, this is hard because it's the whole body that's it, um, sort of working. I'm feeling here that same sort of hissing thing. I'm like, <laughs> and you're feeling as the pitch goes up, the belly comes out. And as the pitch goes down, the belly relaxes. So it's kind of a dynamic thing. Um, as we sing higher pitches, we need it to come out. And as we let pitches go down, we need it to come back in. It'll just naturally relax in. We never want to squeeze or flex in because what that does is we tend to engage these upper abdominal muscles and that cramps our diaphragm. Essentially, it kind of holds it too rigid and it gets stuck and we can't really appropriately uh, control or regulate the pressure underneath. So seems complicated, but the simple thing is you can actually just work these muscles by doing this kind of exercise. You can go You can also do the singing straws. It's a very similar concept. And then and you might notice these muscles, we feel the sensation here. We might try to grip down or bite down here. Keep it very, very loose. You can always move your head and your neck around. And this is a, uh, a trick for me to, to kind of help work through tension that might accumulate. If we're not doing enough with our belly and our back, that support mechanism, we're not grounding things with our breath, then a lot of times these muscles try to help by making the space smaller. So this is one big frustration that a lot of beginning singers have. In fact, singers in general um, at all stages is dealing with tension. And it's not, you know, and this is for uh, singing teachers out there too, is it's not just like, oh, you need to relax because it's more complicated than that. Uh, if we're not engaging appropriately here, our body's trying to compensate and it will almost by reflex 
start to make the space smaller. If our head and our neck comes out like this, right, our jaw gets tight, or our tongue starts to kind of pull back or forward, it's all about squeezing the space. And uh, essentially, we're making the instrument smaller. That leads to tone issues and problems, you know, like people are, it's too bright, or it sounds like I, it's really choppy and not smooth. And um, I'm feeling all this tension. So you can see why, you know, again, this first concept of I don't like the sound and the feeling, that's kind of the whole point of this vocal practice is to help sort of figure out what's trying to help with the process. And once you learn to actually um, train away that coordination, your voice and the range just starts to open up and it feels much more effortless. So um, that's the first thing is as I'm engaging with my belly and my back, I'm trying to make sure that this area stays loose. Um, eventually we learn to control and isolate these things. And then we can start to just put just the right amount of squeeze or the right, you know, kind of collapse the space in just the right way but that takes time. And, and so the first thing is being able to separate different components. So we're working our belly and our back. We're going like, pushing down, the pitch rises up, relaxing, and the pitch falls back down. So first thing I'd recommend is just doing that. And you can, um, you know, check on like a, a website, like uh, singing carrots that shows you, um, your pitches in real time against a piano and it can show you how your voice is changing. You can use a chromatic tuner or a teacher and it can help you understand if you're actually changing the pitch or not. Um, it's great. We need that feedback. And that's the other thing that's hard as a beginning singer is it's an awareness game. So it's hard to know when we're messing up sometimes. Um, if you feel it and you feel a lot of tension, that's usually a sign that things are not quite coordinating appropriately. But a lot of times, uh, people aren't are aware that the pitch is not changing, right? It's just sort of staying in the same place because they're flexing other muscles that aren't specifically involved in that. And so thus we get kind of, people get really tight and they start freaking out because they're like, I just need to squeeze my butt and squeeze my arms and that's going to help my voice stay stable. And it's usually doing the opposite, right? It's making it very hard to uh, move and it's making it really rigid. Um yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, this is why I try to, you know, explain this many, many different ways, because again, it's complex. It's a sensation that you have to find in your body. Um, so that's kind of a prerequisite for a lot of other things is understanding your support. And then you can start to get more specific. Like you could do, try to get a fifth, You're like loose targets. You could, you know, and then try to get more specific. Or you could do it a hum. It could be like, you might notice that things want to change here. And my goal is to keep this very, very loose and to keep trying to isolate these lower abdominal muscles. Again, it feels very indirect. It's not what people think. So, So move it in a big way before you start trying to refine things down. Um, sometimes bigger intervals are actually helpful for people when they're starting out. It's a lot harder to do these really minute changes from one step to the next. Kind of like what I did in my uh, last live stream talking about jazz and doing half steps and all of these things. That's going to be a little more advanced in sensation because it's just hard to control those subtle flexes that make us go from one pitch to the next. And it takes time and some practice. And so thus, you can't, it's not just like, oh, I know the right pitch. I actually have to practice getting the right amount of pressure to get to that pitch. A lot of times people uh, are actually not supported enough on their consonants. And then by the time they get to the vowel, it's too late. So they're like, you know, ma, 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 and you'll hear that. Duh, and it just takes some time to practice this. So that's what we're doing here. It seems so simple, but I'm like, Ma, ma, ma. I'm trying to feel that just the right amount of pressure building up. As you start singing more, it'll feel like this sort of weight dropping and it counterbalances where our pitch is. So the higher our pitch goes, the more we need to feel that sort of weight drop to balance the pitch and how much energy is required. Um, so that's one side of the vocal folds, it's the bottom side. And the other side, we have to deal with resonance, right? And this is another frustrating concept for a lot of singers because 
it's a little more intangible feeling, although there's actually a physical force, right? There's pressure that our resonance uh, creates from our vocal tract here, and it actually stabilizes the vocal folds on the other side. So it's pressure from your lower abdominal muscles, and then we get pressure from the ring or the resonance. And a lot of times, um, beginning singers are not even listening or understanding what I mean by resonance. Um, it's that sort of tinny ringing sound. We can actually analyze it on phone apps. Now there's this um, one called Spectrum View for iPhones where you can actually look at um, the fact that when we sing a single pitch, it's actually many things involved, many overtones are happening. And that makes my voice sound unique compared to another. We learn to shape and sculpt this stuff. And that's how we can change the sound quality of our voice depending on what we're doing. I call that flexibility. It takes some time to learn how to be flexible and to subtly adjust things. So when we're working through things and I'm going um, from one vowel to the next, I'm helping uh, people hear that change in resonance. So often it's hard for us to hear resonance when we're just doing a single pitch. So as we, uh, or as we're doing a single vowel shape, uh, and so as we're changing through different vowel shapes, we can hear that sort of zing zing kind of laser beam like sound. I'll demonstrate. Like if I'm like, kind of sounds like a little didgeridoo like thing. As I'm changing the shape uh, of my my mouth, uh, my tongue, um, these different things, it's it's essentially emphasizing different overtones. And it takes us a sec for our body to feel this out. You know, you might be like, oh, well, that sounds so complicated, but our body does this kind of naturally, actually. So what I first am trying to do is calibrate and feel out these little resonant spots. It's how we talk. So every vowel has a sweet spot and you can feel this out. You can be like, Yuck. you hear a like slightly different sound. Um, so when I'm doing my humming things, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm actually going through vowel shapes internally and I'm feeling out where that buzz is in that ring. And it's a very physical process. It's, um, it's a sensation thing and I'm sort of realigning my sensation. So this is the way that I try to get my sort of body connected to my mind. Um, and I know that that kind of resonance when my mouth is closed because of voice science I know that that resonance is going to help my voice find stability. Uh, and so that's going to help me relax muscles around the larynx. So at the same time, I'm going. Trying to release the external muscles and just isolate what's going on internally. And again, the process, if you're feeling like you're consciously controlling anything around your throat, you're probably squeezing muscles around the larynx, because again, we can't really consciously control these muscles. So um, this process can be a really great uh, just discovery of how your body works, how um, sensations change and feel as you move things. And that's the best way to start the practice out. And you don't have to do anything super advanced. It's just, can I feel resonance? Can I feel lower belly support and control? Uh, And then once you get both, you're going to have balance in, uh, in your voice. It, you know, we find different places of balance, at different notes, and it's going to feel slightly different at each pitch. So then you might do the next thing and go like, ah. so you see, I'm using sirens today to kind of explore this feeling. It's just a, a natural sort of sensation, starting with the Z thing, because I can really feel the pressure, like Z-Z-Z-Z. it really helps stimulate our lower body. And then, using these concepts of glides, going from a small vowel, u to a, and e to a, ya and wa, and it's going to help me sort of feel out what resonance is like when things are lined up appropriately. If you're feeling like things are blocked, sometimes there's something on our cords, and there's little crackles you'll hear from hard mucus, dehydration, inflammation. Um, and sometimes it's just because things are out of alignment. So I'm checking my alignment. I'm trying to make sure that everything feels comfortable and is sort of stacked with my lower body. And you're going to find more and more resonance happens. In fact, it's kind of a synonym for resonance is synchronized motion when things are all vibrating together and they're not being blocked. Uh, we get this boosting effect and then our voice fills out and it gets larger and larger. So it's support and it's resonance. 
And this is just sort of, you know, a how to to explain like, why are we doing all these things? A lot of people jump into this and it's like, whoa, it's, you know, feel like you're just thrown into the pool, right? It's sort of a completely immersive thing. It's like, uh, some people need the explanation. You know, again, that's like the voice science things where there's, you know, like, a lot, you know, there's some people who talk about this, some teachers who are like, you know, I didn't understand what people meant by the feelings and the sensations. So it's good to learn it from that side. Some people like that doesn't help them at all. So we need to actually just do tricks to try and feel the right thing and have a teacher guide you through it who understands uh, both sides. So again, I'm doing like uh, feeling my belly check. Then I'm gonna feel resonance. You know, some some days it might be a little extra blocked, and so it takes a second. So then I go like, <laughs> making sure that none of these muscles are getting involved. Um, that's why I'm sort of moving around like that. And then, oh, I'm doing the siren everything open, making sure that I have resonance there. And then I feel my belly kind of tracking with things. Again, it's pushing down as the voice goes up and then it's sort of relaxing as the voice comes back down. You know, a song is just a more specific version of this, right? If you can go, oh, then you can hit all of those notes. It's just going to take, you know, within a song, you know, a, a simple song, uh, it's just going to take some time to sort of refine and get more accurate. This is why we talk about numbers and we use all of that sort of system to try to understand things. But again, as a beginning singer, it's more important just to connect to the body and to feel these sensations. And again, our checklist is resonance, that's tinny ringing sound, um, a feeling or sensation of our breath dropping and pushing down and out with our lower abdominal belly, uh, and freedom and release here. If you feel tension or squeezing, it's a sign that things are out of balance. Um, and we can kind of hear this too. Again, a, a singing teacher is going to be really connected to that because, you know, we've been through the practice. So we have a lot of good intuition as well as um, can understand and hear certain things or all visually see certain things when they're out of balance and they're a little tight or tense. We're just trying to find efficiency. Once you have that control, you can start to do a lot, right? Um, that's That's actually, I think, the best way to practice all of this stuff. When we're singing in the moment, we can't think about all these things. We have to just rely on our muscle memory and trust stuff. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, is another frustration for singers, which uh, is music. What should I sing? This is hard because a lot of songs that we hear are very impressive. Uh, they're doing advanced things. So we want to find songs that are workshopable, that fit with the vibe and the style that we like. This can be a little bit of a process. Um, you know, I look at lists of like great songs for beginners, and I'm sometimes surprised by some of the very challenging songs that show up there. Um, again, this is a challenge for, for singers. I recommend uh, working with a teacher. That's a lot of times what I'm doing is trying to help sort of guide people to the right songs. And also teaching people you don't have to finish a song. You can just work on material. It's like being a painter, learning to paint a landscape or something like that, or just work on like a, a circle, these kinds of things. It's totally fair game just to work on little bits of material that are comfortable. Um, a teacher can help you find a better place to sort of work on those ranges. And generally we want songs with a smaller or more limited range, like, um, you know, but under an octave, sometimes you'll get songs that are around like a fifth or a sixth and it. That's going to be a better place to start. So like I talk about like, um, this is a little bit larger, but like can't help falling in love or the rose, like these kinds of simple little tunes that can help us just practice our technique and understand how we are controlling pitch. So we have some targets to work with. Um, those are just a few simple examples. There's tons of them out there. Uh, again, this is a challenge for a lot of singers. Uh, and I recommend using karaoke tracks. You know, there's all these great websites online now. We're sort of in a golden age where you can take a song um, that's that they've, they've uploaded. And there's multiple versions a lot of times, uh, like an acoustic version or one that sounds exactly like the original. And then you can change how high or low it is, um, how slow or fast it is. And you can start to customize something so it's easier to practice with. Because as a singer, it's hard if we don't know other instruments, right? It's, 
it's nice to be able to accompany yourself with some basic chords. That helps us feel a little less exposed. As a singer, um, singing a cappella can be some of the hardest stuff because we don't have any targets uh, and you know from other instruments to kind of help ground us. We, we can easily get lost, right? So this is what happens with like people singing the national anthem a cappella, right? That makes it extra hard. Um, so because you know they have to just do it with their own memory and sensation and feedback from the sound, and sometimes that's really hard to hear yourself while you're doing that in a really large space. Uh, and if you're not really comfortable with this game of, of sensation, you might way overshoot or way undershoot things, constantly changing keys, singing out of tune, right? This is what happens for a lot of people. Um, I think we we shame this a little too much, right? It's actually uh, really challenging. And I am always have a lot of respect for people who have the courage to go up and try these things. I recommend that you try them in less high stakes situations. So it's like a lot of people are like, how do I test out my voice uh, in a way that's safe where I'm not like, here's my big debut, um, practice recording yourself. Um, we, we have a feedback thing that we just uh, launched on 30 Day Singer. So you can get feedback from us. Um, having a teacher uh, doing like open mic night things. These are great ways to start with a, just a smaller crowd of people who are in the community who are supportive, right? Because a lot of uh, other people who don't understand the practice are just not going to understand. And so that's where sometimes we can get a lot of um, shaming and other things that happen and um, that, that doesn't feel good. And so that makes people a lot of scared, a lot of people scared to try doing this kind of stuff. Um, so that's sort of this game, you know, we can have goals, certain songs can be really challenging and you want to figure out what do I do to get to that? How do I design my practice? You know, maybe it uses a lot of head voice or maybe um, it's a much higher range than uh, you're comfortable with at this point. So you do other songs as stepping stones to get there. And this is part of this practice. This is what I'm doing all, all the time is helping people sort of gauge what songs are hard and why. Uh, and again, it changes from person to person based on what uh, tension habits you might have or um, where your range is. Because sometimes, you know, you're converting a, a female song to a, you know, a lower voice kind of, uh, you know, male singer is trying to do that. And we have to figure out sort of a place that it can sit where it's more comfortable. Um, it just depends, right? So this gets a little more nebulous than people would like. Uh, I just recommend that you explore, that you ask questions, that you pay attention to what it's feeling like, um, and get help from, from teachers. We can really speed this process up, uh, even with just like a few sessions to help you understand like, oh, uh, your tongue is blocking the vowel so that you're not getting uh, the, the perfect shape. It's kind of getting uh, a little thick or a little tight, and that's making uh, it so there's no resonance and there's no ring in that sound. And that's why you're, you know, squeezing, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's what's happening in a lot of these sessions. So again, I think the big thing that holds people back is that they simply just don't like the sound of their voice and it doesn't feel very good. That's just a sign that there's some work to be done and there's definitely a process. And I think that's very rewarding when you learn how to find freedom in your voice and power on uh, flexibility. So that's, that's this whole process. You know, I just, I try to encourage people to, to keep trying and understanding, you know, what's going on with their voice. That's kind of making them hit some blocks. Um, finding music that you're really inspired about is really helpful, right? That was this last category. Understanding just what the practice is about is a big one. So it's, some people will just do the routines kind of by rote, just sort of like, oh, I'm supposed to do this 10 times a day, but you're not going to get very much out of it if you're not start asking your these questions slowing down. I always tell people the practice is not as linear as we would like. You know, if you're working through stuff and you, you know, let's say you're in a recording session or whatever it is. And again, this isn't for a beginner singer, but, uh, and you realize, oh, I'm like feeling really, really tight. And then you might take a moment and check your posture and be like, oh, I'm like, I got off my axis and I need to reset, do some stretches, some shoulder rolls, reconnect with my breath. A lot of the times that's going to help you a lot more than just trying to push harder, right? So this is what happens is we get frustrated and we tend to over-engage with our voice. Less is more. People tend to just do too much. Um, and this is this is the challenge. We emotionally attach to um, think sensations that we can really 
feel like, you know, so it's like, oh, if I'm flexing all these muscles, then I must be really doing something. Uh, and that's, again, that tends to backfire. It's actually a much softer feeling than people would think. But we need to move these muscles in a big way. We have to feel them out first before we can really start to get finesse. You know, I, I can't as a teacher be like, okay, beginning student, subtly flex your lower abdominal muscle in order to hit this pitch. It takes repetition. It takes a lot of mistakes and a lot of funny sounds. I find the best, uh, some of the best singers that I know are just people who are comfortable experimenting and exploring sounds and imitating and mimicking things, right? That's a huge skill in singing. It's just the power of imitation uh, with, again, the caveat of if it feels uh, uncomfortable and painful, then you're doing something wrong and you should stop and reevaluate, slow down, don't sing so high, right? Find a comfortable place and the voice grows from the middle out. It, it really does. It's not about necessarily high notes. Oftentimes the voice relaxes first and then we're actually able to engage things. So the big plug is patience, understanding the practice, feeling the sensations out, it's just not what people expect when they when they first sort of take a lesson from me, uh, but you know again you'll you'll see results. Um, I you know I have a number of students who have really seen some some huge changes. It just takes a little bit of time to rewire the muscle memory and learn this particular skill, uh, and I think everyone should. It, it's a really really gratifying uh, experience. Uh, it, it's good for you, and uh, again the the path is just to first start and to accept where your voice is and understand that and be aware of it and go towards those sort of sticky sensations a little bit and ask questions why they're happening. Um, and then you might find that actually what you aesthetically want uh, starts to happen more often. And uh, that's sort of this, this sort of plug. So we talked about some basic technique things, right? Like getting our lower breath going. That's one of the first things. Again, people go for high notes and they're all revved up and they they do this, right? And that's unfortunately a mistake. It's the energy comes from sinking down, from grounding downward. So you'll notice these singers do this a lot. They're sort of showing what they're doing with their lower body, that feeling of grounding down. And then, and then you can try different vowels. You can be like, Oh, once you can start to control that, then you can get more specific and, and work on pitch accuracy. A song is just about getting a specific route down. Um, so again, this process, uh, it might feel a little overwhelming, but the cool thing is, is music is so um, repetitive. There's... Uh, it's like an ever-changing sort of kaleidoscope. It's like the same stuff in slightly different places. Um, and so once you start to get a handle over this pattern and you listen to more music, you'll realize that getting one song down is the answer to getting like a hundred songs down. Um, yeah, it, it really is. And you'll, and you'll find that there's so much repetition with certain things. So a lot of the struggle that I have with students is literally just trying to get a few songs comfortable where they can feel control over the voice uh, and feeling pretty satisfied with it and embracing the sound of their voice. Exactly. When we resist against things, that's where a lot of the tension starts to happen actually is when we're trying to hold or place or control things um, uh, in a frustrated way. And that's, uh, or and out of uh, fear and these kinds of things. So it takes some time. You have to do this practice on your own before you get out and you do it in front of people with lights and all these things on you because they're going to serve to distract you from that muscle memory, uh, from the sensation. So again, this is this process. I'm trying to get people just to get a few songs down. And then from there, it snowballs and you actually can get a number of songs down. And then more you know, complex technical things come into play, like re what are registers? And then the whole sensation thing gets a little more uh, more interesting. I didn't want to go into too much detail about that, but yeah, hopefully this is helpful. Again, it's just a slightly different approach, a little more laid back. Um, and I encourage you like humming this actually plug, you know, cause like, uh, it was mother's day yesterday, but one thing I'm very grateful for is that my, um, my mother was constantly humming and singing and making little silly songs. They were not perfect with pitch. They, 
Uh, but it's actually something that I think is very, very helpful. Um, it's a great way to explore your voice. Don't worry about hitting the right things. You might find that just by humming and sort of feeling that um, the sensations, you're going to start to notice some of these things about your voice. And you might find that you start falling into certain patterns because it's very um, intuitive in some ways. We actually have trouble breaking out of the most common patterns like the major scale and the minor scale. Uh, it's just sort of a natural sensation. I call it sort of like tonal gravity. We feel um, these patterns, we hear them all the time. Uh, and so they're just sort of in our brains. And as you explore them, you might find that you actually start to understand that more through sensation. So for beginners, it's a little bit of explaining the science, mainly just so people know that uh, I know what I'm talking about and, uh, and that it's grounded in some facts. But it's mainly about just understanding the sensation. And you can find pitch accuracy through that. You can find um, strength in your voice. You can find resonance. All of these things just by slowing down, sort of playing with it a little bit before you get to trying to do some sort of advanced song. Because I think that's what happens is like we hear these, you know, really, really advanced, like impressive things. And then we try to do it and we feel this discrepancy between where our voice is and where that like pro athlete is. And then that shuts people down. And just think about any other sport. That's just that's just not how it happens. Um, it takes some time and it's a learned skill and it's it's really highly rewarding. And then as you go deeper into the practice, it becomes about your expression, about your presence and all these other things, which can be really, really powerful um, skills to learn. Uh, learning how to control and calm your nerves, how to get into the flow or the zone. Uh, so yeah, there you have it. I, we're just at the end of time and um, I'll see everyone in a few weeks and we'll keep talking about all of this. But again, this is about if you're feeling discouraged, if you're like, what the heck is everyone doing? I see all these ads for all these singing teachers. And I'm totally lost. Um, that's kind of what this one was about is just to sort of help you get a foothold into this. Um, and talking about, uh, you know, I think just to, as a last thing, the tension game, right? It's just a challenge. We Once we are aware of certain tensions, we can get really frustrated. It's one of those things like don't think about the pink elephant, right? It's like, oh, you have jaw tension. And when we think about it, we tend to engage it more. So instead of that, you know, yes, we have to address these things. I check my, you know, with my hand. I try to feel the sensation. Uh, but generally, I'm just trying to find balance. And in some ways, actually the absence of too much sensation. When everything's in balance, it uh, it just sort of is flowing very freely. It's like the engine is humming along uh, and it feels almost uh, disconcertingly uh, disconnected. It feels effortless. And that's a sort of a floating sensation. It's really, really exciting when you find that, but it also can be kind of, it can freak people out. So uh, again, if you're feeling a lot of release and you hear that sound and it's nice and open and clean, then you're doing things, your body is doing something correctly. So when it's good, it's good. I'll leave with this sort of uh, last maxim, which is like, when it's good, it's good. We're just checking in with our body to make sure that things are uh, in balance, like it's maintenance, right? Uh, and then we're sometimes working on growing and expanding things, but it's mainly checking in. And that's what I think a lot of people are missing actually about the practice. So it's if it's working well, then great, enjoy, experience, you know, the sensation of it, get lost in the music. If you're feeling stuck and you're like, ooh, that sensation, there's something really off with it, then go back and evaluate it. But uh, again, so I think sometimes people are like, what should I be feeling? What should I be doing? Um, it's going to be changing a little bit. You know, my teacher back in the day, I um, was like, what is support? It, it changes a little bit every day and we have to reconnect. Um, but that's extremely rewarding. So a good singer is present with their their voice, present with uh, their body, and going from there. So really awesome. Um, I know it's a lot of talking this time. We'll get to some more specific exercises next time. But you could see if I just jump right into doing exercises, it can be a little overwhelming because it's like, what am I trying to think about? What am I trying to feel for? And so that's where it's really great to get some one-on-one -on -one work if you're really confused by a lot of these things. And then of course, once you understand these things, then it's about getting into a routine and trying to get some consistency. Uh, and that's going to really help you take, take you to the next level. So uh, awesome work, everybody. And I will catch you all in a few weeks with some new topics.
You too. Have a good rest of your day. Take care.